miles to tap town my name is finbar and this is steve adelson synergistic you know there's only a handful of names that immediately come to mind when referring to the chapman stick legends of the instrument virtuosos players inventors uh, instrument makers educators the list goes on and on but there really is only one steve adelson um, steve has had a long and illustrious career playing with some of the biggest names on the planet he's also an educator producing many publications and videos to help the next generation of stick players Steve has this unique ability to um, have synergy between mind and body and be able to sort of incorporate scrapes, pops, taps, all these sort of subtle nuances into his sound. And it, it's really something that's beholding to watch. Anyway, that being said, we had a great conversation. Uh, we talked about the early days of him starting the stick right the way the progression to where he is today. It's a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. And without further ado, Hit it. So Steve, so great to have you here on uh, 12,000 Miles to Tap Town. It's, uh, you're obviously a big inspiration to me and a big inspiration to a lot of the people. So thank you for your time. And I'm honored to be part of this great project. And I thank you for putting in the effort and uh, you know all, all the nice people and inspiring and motivated people that you've interviewed in the past. So I, I appreciate you having me as part of the program. Beautiful, Matt. Well, I appreciate you and you appreciate me. So we all appreciate each other. So it's awesome. <laughs> Mutual Appreciation Society. Abbott and exactly. Costello, 19, exactly. uh, whatever. <laughs> exactly. So, Steve, you know, um, this series is really trying to put a spotlight on on the art of tapping and really Emmett's really big invention here. You know, I know that people were tapping before that, but this whole concept that Emmett came up with, which has born so many different players and styles and, and other instruments. So, you know, just like to start with, how did you get started uh, on this journey um, of tapping and, and touch style? Where did that start? Uh, well, I was playing guitar from 1969. Uh, actually, was at uh, Woodstock, New York, the big 1969 festival, and uh, I didn't even play guitar. A friend of mine showed me a couple of chords, and I got addicted to guitar. And I was studying regular guitar and eventually jazz guitar. And I was always trying to do more. You know. Uh, I think, I guess, Michael Hedges. I, I don't remember the exact dates, but I was always like searching for more. And then one day in 1983, I believe, uh, on the corner of Bleecker and LaGuardia, I'm walking around just hanging out and it was a big crowd on the corner and, and I I couldn't figure out what was going on. I looked over the top and there was this guy tapping on the guitar. Turned out to be Stanley Jordan. Wow. I saw that. I go, that's amazing. I went home and immediately tried pre uh, tapping on the guitar. Uh probably thought I was doing good, but then I met Emmett Chapman a few months later and said, if I'm going to pursue this tapping technique, this is the instrument for me. And let me finish a good story. Now the stick, stick was, you know, there was no internet, so it was very difficult to get a stick because nobody knew about it. It wasn't distributed, but Sam Ash music in New York had sticks. Right. I walked into the store in Brooklyn. They had one stick. Uh, it was $900 being the starving musician. I didn't even have $900. And I'm going to save up for it. But Paul Ash, one of the owners, corporate man, but music lover said, you know what? I want you to have the stick. I'm putting in $900 in the register because I want you to have it. You owe me 900 bucks. Pay me when you can. Wow. I changed my life. Within a month, I said, you know what? I like this instrument because he would allow me to return it if I didn't like it. 
but I loved it. Sold my coin collection, sold whatever I had, paid them the 900 bucks. And that's how I physically got started. That's how I got the instrument. Uh, with the graces of Paul Ash, if he, if he didn't do that, I wouldn't know you. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. It's really amazing. It's, it is an amazing, it's, it is an amazing journey. How like one of my mantras is, you know, today I might wake up and meet someone who will change my life. And there it is. Yeah. That, there's that story right there. Right. And you wouldn't expect it from a corporate executive because he's working on what now is probably a billion dollar enterprise. Um, and it wasn't about the bottom line. He, he wanted musicians to have a, an instrument and pursue their passion. And I knew him. It wasn't like I was from out off the street, but he was that, that generous to trust me and say, you have to have this instrument. I'm paying. I'm paying for it. You pay me back. It's amazing too because I used to live on Balika and LaGuardia. I was like right above a nightclub called La Souk there, which is um, and then to the club, and then I was on that second level on a on a big New York loft there. So I, I can't believe that you know. Probably twenty years later, I was here. Here I was living in in Manhattan, and and you know I used to go to Sam Ash and. Manny's sure. and all those sort of stores. So, you know. Yeah. I think on the corner, across from, the, there's a bit around, was around the corner. It was there's a club the over there. I think it was called, uh, it was on the corner of Walk and Don't Walk. I think that right. was the name of the club. Right. Amazing. So, cool area. So, Steve, you teach people from all over the world, and I'm sort of really interested. Um, the stick can sort of look really, really overwhelming. What are the, um, what do you find are the motivating factors in someone actually going on this journey and learning the stick? I think the, the new players who, who buy a stick, first of all, I think they're mostly motivated by seeing Tony Levin because Tony plays in front of, you know, 2,000 people, 5,000 people. Uh, he's the bass player with Peter Gabriel. He plays with King Crimson. So if he brings out the stick, there's a large crowd that's seeing him. Right. So a lot of players that I've encountered to say, yeah, I saw Tony Levin, I had to get one of those. Right. Okay. So he's he's given the most exposure outside of the internet and, and things like that because most players, you know, play small clubs. But Tony plays in front of a lot of people now. He plays mostly as a bass player. The stick is an alternate instrument. He doesn't play exclusively stick. Right. So I think most people see that and don't even understand maybe that there's so many different avenues you could do with the stick. I came from a guitar background. Yeah. A lot of the more well known stick players are bass players. You got Tony. Uh, Alfonso Johnson, who played with uh, Weather Report and uh, Santana. Uh, John Myung from Dream Theater. So some of the more well-known stick players are bass players. I see yeah. it as a guitar. It actually, as an orchestra. I, I have the bass. I have the guitar. So many possibilities. So, you know, some people just think it's cool, and it is. There's no doubt it's cool. Uh, some people want to be Tony Levin, or they want to play King Crimson music, and you got to have the right tool. There's actually... Uh, a Pink Floyd cover band. I forget the name of the Pink Floyd cover band. And Tony was on one of the Pink Floyd records, Momentary Lapse of Reason. The bass player in that band bought a stick because he wanted to be authentic and play one of the tracks. Wow. That had a stick on it. He didn't, he didn't want to substitute a bass. There was a stick on the track or two, and he said, I'm getting a stick. And so that was his motivation to get the stick. Wow. Uh, so wow. I see it, when I got it, it was like the next step of the guitar. Here's the guitar. You've done everything on it. Everybody else has done everything on it. Now, may, maybe every 20 years, a new guy comes along. Stanley Jordan, Michael Hedges. There was Hendrix. There was Wes Montgomery. The innovators come along. But, you know, the pedestrian guitar player, they, they're not going to find anything new, really. You can copy Van Halen and you can copy Hendrix, but it's been done. And to be innovative, I'll give a, a shout out to, to my friend Ben Lacey. He's the next innovator on guitar. Right. So unless, so to me, the journey was, all right, if I pick up this instrument, I can be innovative to myself, do the tapping, do multiple parts, play chords I've never heard before. So it was an easy road or an outlet to be innovative without trying to find something unique on the guitar, which is ultimately almost impossible, mm -hmm. except for like the, you know, a couple of guys I mentioned. So the people who buy the stick, multiple reasons. They, they want to be, they want to play in King Crimson. They want to use it as an alternate bass sound, or to me, it's it's a whole orchestra, it's a whole universe, and it's inspiring. You know, I'll hit a chord and just I've never heard it before. You know, you, for people who don't know, you can play up to twelve notes on the stick at the same time. Mm. So even on a guitar, if you're playing a thirteenth chord which has seven notes, you have to leave something out. Mm. There's only six strings, and if you get a seven string guitar, yes, but now you get an eight string guitar, you might as well get a ten or twelve string stick. 
Uh, and you got the best of all the worlds. You can play piano parts. You can play bass parts. You can play guitar parts. Um, to me, it's, it's like I said, it's the arrangements, the orchestration is harmonically. Yeah, from, there's nothing on the planet. Yeah. From an arrangement and orchestration point of view, I, it really, what it did for me, as uh, someone who's learned all this theory and music and stuff my whole life is it finally put the puzzle pieces together because it was sort of the, when you're playing polychords, a chord on a chord, and then looking at the actual voicing of that and, and just then just realizing that these just co two chord structures as they're moving around the different chord mm -hmm. shapes and then how that relates. It was as a guitar player, you don't get the chance to do that, but as a keyboard player, you do. So it gives you this insight that keyboard players have, plus it gives you the ability to play like a guitar and a bass part or put it together and create a whole new unique sound. Um, you know, so for me, it was like, wow, it's like a whole new palette of stuff that's in front of me that, you know, like to me, I, I wasn't inspired to go and learn keyboard. Um, just because it didn't inspire me, but the stringed instrument and the way it sounds and the nuances of the strings and the different effects you can put on the different sides, to me, that was much more familiar. But then it basically gave me this palette that a keyboard player had in front of them. So it was just amazing. I think even more so because on a keyboard, in each hand, maybe you can reach 10 notes. If you have big hands, 11. On the stick, you can go from a C and go like 20 notes higher in the, within three inches. Mm. So your, your range in both hands is even more incredible. So you have that piano uh, arrangement, harmo harmonic possibilities, but even more so in a sense. And like you said, you have the guitar expression and, you know, the vibratos, all that kind of stuff, the bends, the slides, which you can't do on a piano. Yeah. You can do on an electronic keyboard. Uh, so all instruments have their pluses and minuses. I think the stick has the best of both worlds. It's got a lot of possibilities harmonically. It can play melody like a guitar. Uh, it's got bass possibilities. Uh, depends on how far you want to pursue it. Mm. To me, actually, it's just getting started. I mean, it's only been around f for 40 some odd years, almost 50 years. Very few players are really like exploring it that much. Yeah. Right. So if we had, if we had 10 million stick players, like there are 100 million guitar players, the level of playing would be that much higher because we're going very slowly. And yeah, it's, well, it's with it, no pun intended. The, 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 the possibilities haven't been tapped yet. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's no that, that is good fun, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, I, I know you, like, because uh, obviously when I started getting onto <clears throat> this journey of, of uh, call it tap style or touch style or free hands or whatever it was, um, um, the for me it was like – it, it, it's you well, obviously you were my real first teacher on this but you play so many different styles you can play jazz you can play funk you can play blues you can play uh rock you can play and so you, when you were showing me all these styles with the instrument you know i've heard other people play the stick and they all sound like very similar they've got a very similar sort of mm -hmm. thing but what really inspired me about um your playing was how you got the groove back in the dead notes and the you really worked on on you know, you've got all that sort of ambient stuff, which is really nice and sounds great too, but it's that being able to use it as a percussive instrument as well as a melodic instrument. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how did you start to develop that technique? Well, I think, you know, that every instrument has its uh, easy spots. Like if you say somebody go to piano, hit all the white notes, you're in the key of C, simple. You go to guitar, you learn a couple of basic chords in the first spot, but if you want to explore more, there's chords all up and down the neck, there's all kinds of slapping techniques. So I found that playing certain easy triads, which is what a lot of, you know, it's easy to play, didn't excite me. So I was exploring, saying, okay, how do I get an upright bass sound? How do I get a Victor Wooten slap sound? How do I get West Montgomery? And, and to me, that's the challenge, which I, I actually love, because there's nothing written for the stick except some King Crimson music. So how do I make James Brown sound like, integrity on, on the stick not just the right notes um how do i make my goal at first was ron carter on the bass west montgomery on the melody side of course i play other stuff too but how do i make it sound authentic like west montgomery not just the right notes and there's plenty of songs i've tried and i got i got all the right notes it doesn't sound like the song to me if i take like a metallica song it's not happening you got to dig in and, and the stick doesn't do that so to me, maybe somebody will find a way to do that. But that's what I'm saying. There's not enough guitar players, not enough stick players, rather, to really, like, take it to the next and the next and the next level. Uh, you know, Hendrix learned from the people before, and Wes Montgomery learned from Charlie Christian. 
So there's an exponential, you know, raising of the bar. Mm. Stick is going very slow. So, but I, I would argue that you do that. Like you, you've taken that bar. You've sort of, um, you, you know, you do stuff that I haven't heard other other stick players do. So you know. trying to be stick a stick musician i'm trying to play music to, to me the satisfaction was being able to sit in with people like stanley jordan like omar hakeem like rachel z some some high level players larry coriel um and and say and they say you're playing music you're not playing the stick and and i, I made a couple of cds where i had a bunch of guitar players on it we did some duos trios with two guitars and, and, a, and a stick and when people listen to it, they go, which one's the stick? Which one's the guitar? Mission accomplished. Because I don't want to stand out like, oh, it's the novelty guy. You should I say, um, the, you should say the, the bits that you like, the really good bits, that's me. And <laughs> everyone right. else, that's them. <laughs> All those wrong notes, that's Larry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's another story for another time. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I made a, 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 one album. is mostly duos and trios. And I... I was very satisfied because I'm playing with aforementioned Ben, Ben Lacey and he's incredible. And we're like, hopefully on par with each other and, and Kelly Minucci and some blues guys. And to me, it was like, it was a band. It wasn't like we have this novelty guy playing this wacky instrument. Mm. Uh, tone wise, idea wise, that's the hard part. Tone wise, cause you're tapping, it's a different tone. Uh, concept wise, idea wise. I wanted to sound like an authentic bass and an authentic guitar player. And sometimes with, with synths. I did actually two tracks on two different CDs with Tony Levin too. Right. That was cool. Two sticks. Yeah. So, Steve, how do you find? I know you teach a lot of people, but um, how do you find when the guy, when the person gets the stick because it looks cool, um, and it's like it's it's totally different. So it's like the strings are different. One's inverted. The uh, you know in in a lot of cases, you know, the strings are inverted on the bass, and you have got this different tuning. What? How do you get someone? to understand the change in their mind when they're so used to one way of doing things. It's sort of like, and, and get over that hump, that initial, uh, because I, like I, I show people, you know, um, my sticks or war guitars or whatever I've got. And it's like, they just get so overwhelmed straight away. And I'm trying to try and go, look, just don't get overwhelmed. It's just, it's just something different. How, how do you start to help them guide them through that initial period of, a foreign, you know, like um, trepidation. It's funny you should say that because at, at times I've done like demos at guitar conventions or at the NAM show, and some famous guitar player would walk by. And I go, "You want to try it?" And their response is, "Get that thing away from me! It's too intimidating." <laughs> I go, "Intimidating? You're like a virtuoso. What do you mean it's intimidating?" Um, well, when I tell them, and, and they don't realize it at first, it's actually easier than a guitar in certain respects because on a guitar. I remember in 1969, I learned a G chord and an E chord and a D chord, and they're all different shapes. The sick is basically six shapes, and you can do anything with six shapes, three majors and three minors. And they go, I don't know what you're talking about. But after we get through a couple of lessons, they go, oh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And as an example, if we want to get a little technical, uh, if you want to play an A minor nine, which is A, C, E, G, B, those last three notes, five, seven, and nine is G, B, D, G chord. So the left hand plays an A minor, the right hand plays a G major, simple shapes, and now you have this complex chord. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how many listeners are going to understand that, but it, if you make it logical mathematically, which is what it is, people have to remember also, Emmett Chapman is a scientist, besides being a player. He's made this thing very logical. Even what people don't realize on the stick, I don't think it's on the war guitar, the dot markers are every five frets, not every two frets, like on a guitar or maybe the war guitar. If you play the first a dot on the first string, you go to the second string, the next dot is the exact same note. There's actually a reason for the dots being like that. Mm. On a guitar, the dots are visual markers that don't mean anything. Mm. You just know where the seventh fret is, but the seventh fret has nothing to do with the third fret. Yep. On the stick, 
a real quick description, everything between the dot on two and the dot on seven is the same notes on seven and 12, one string removed. There's a lot of logic to it. Yeah. And even on the bass side, the order of the notes is exactly like a regular bass or guitar, just inverted intervals. So four of the strings on the bass side are E, A, D, G, just like a bass. But they're going down instead of up. So if you play fingering patterns, just like you would play on a bass, you're going to get the right notes. But every time you change a string, it's going to go down an octave instead of going up. Mm. That's actually beneficial in a sense because you're playing new uh, new ideas. Mm. It's inherent in the instrument. You play your bass pattern, your arpeggio, and now it, the octaves change, which would be very hard to do on a regular bass. Plus, Plus you can play chords and, and the... The thicker string is in the middle of the neck, which is easier to reach with your left hand rather than reaching right to the top of the fingerboard. So it's it's ergonomically ergonomically it's um it's much much easier as well. Another quick anecdote: um, when you play piano, we talked about the piano before. When you want to play unisons, your hands are like this. I don't know if they're both in the screen. Here you go. So if you're going to go left hand, you're going to go from the pinky right this way, and from the left, right hand, thumb. So you're going to go like this. On the stick, your hands are like this. So it's the same fingers. So if I want to play a scale, third finger, second finger, first finger, there's less thought behind it. So I did a demo once, and some guy named Victor Wooten was watching me at the NAMM show. And I've been playing two scales in each hand, like going crazy. And he goes, that's unbelievable. One's going up, one's going down. One's... And it's actually easier to do that. But he was fascinated that the right hand went down, and the left hand with the same exact fingering went up. And that's just like a, a bonus part of playing the stick. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't tell him it was easy. I said, yeah, I've been working on this for forever. It's so fucking hard. Excuse yeah, my language. Let me confuse you with my magic. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah. yeah. So, actually, <laughs> well, you just mentioned that. I do magic as a hobby also. Oh, and really? I feel sometimes when I do this, it's like hocus pocus. Like slight- I, I once did a, Do you a, ever have a, a, like a rabbit come out the top of your, your stick? Uh, no, no. <laughs> that's that could be good entertaining. <laughs> um, I, I went to an audition for a restaurant I was going to play at. They had music, and I bring my amplifier, bring my stick, and I'm playing. And the guy goes, I don't want pre recorded music. I go, What are you talking about? He goes, You have the background tracks. I go, well, Look, I'm playing. If I stop, it stops. <laughs> no, no, there must be a tape in the amplifier. And basically, I said, You know what? Good luck with your restaurant. I'll see you later. <laughs> You should have said, you should have said I, I, I don't really like prepackaged food. And he goes, what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have to go back and find him if he's in business yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, Steve, so what are you up to now, mate? Like, um, where's the stick taking you on this uh, right at the moment? Well, obviously, because of COVID, things have uh, shut down quite a bit. Um, yeah. So, you know, from the first 67 years of my life, I was in New York. I started playing the stick in six, uh, I'm sorry, 83. You know, I was a pretty good guitar player, got the stick, was working pretty regularly in New York. Uh, a couple of restaurant gigs, some concerts. I produced a jazz festival for 16 years, which obviously I played in. And I got a chance because I was the producer to play with some, you know, Charlie Hunter and Stanley Jordan and uh, Omar. And, you know, it's my, my festival. So I played with all these people, which was yeah, a lot of fun. Right. Uh, and it got me some inroads. These people recorded with me. And then uh, because of some personal reasons, um, we moved here to Arizona. So we get to Arizona. Very nice. Got a nice house. And then the, COVID hits and everything shut down. So when I got here, I actually had a couple of gigs and they said, uh, starting in March, you're done because of COVID. This is, you know, last year, um, year before this past March. So for that whole time in COVID, I didn't play at all, but I practiced a lot. It gave me time to practice. I have a little casita in the back, which is a little house. And because I had so much free time, 
I use it actually, it's actually beneficial in a sense because when you want a gig, you know, you want to play songs people know, you know, especially if you're playing restaurants and lounges and stuff. So you learn a Beatles song and you learn a Nora Jones song and you sneak in a Pat Metheny song or whatever. But this gave me an opportunity. I'm not going to be working for a year and a half anyway. Let me explore the instrument. So I'm exploring different voicings and different chords. So it was a very exploratory time for a year and a half. Right. Uh, now things are opening up a little bit. Hopefully they won't close again because of the uh, nature of what the, what's going on. I'm sure it's similar in Australia. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, so it's, I got it's a couple here. Of- we're, we're on our sixth lo- – as of the time of we're recording right now, we're on our sixth lockdown. Um, wow. You know, so we're – we're super strict here, um, but but look again. It's I'm like you, you know. I use this time to do my album and start right. the show, and uh, so just try and get into a different mindset and just uh, make the most of it. Right. So now now that it's coming out a little bit, even hopefully it won't close down. And uh, America has a little different attitude than Australia, also as you I'm sure yeah. have seen. It's a lot of a lot of battling about what should be open, who who's wearing a mask, who should die, who shouldn't die, all that crap. Yeah. Anyway, that's another that's another show, right? So uh, I do have a couple of nice gigs coming up. Uh, one of them I'm looking forward to, there's a, a museum here called the Musical Instrument Museum. It's in Phoenix. I played there three times when I lived in New York. I flew out. Uh, one time, I think it was about five or six years ago. For, first of all, they had every instrument in the world. They, they did not have a Chapman stick. And I'm visiting just as a tourist. And I said to the administ- administration, why is there no Chapman stick? We're working on it. We're working on it. I go, let's, let's do it. And we eventually got in touch with Emma Chapman. We installed an exhibit. And then I said, guess what? All these instruments you have here, the sousaphone, Mr. Sousa, John Philip Sousa, he's dead. Adolf Sachs, he's dead. Emma Chapman is still alive. Let's bring him in. So we brought him in. We had a, a Chapman stick day. We did a clinic. We did a concert at night. So that was the last time I played there. I'm playing there again in November, November 16th. Wow, Awesome. It's going to be very cool. So they invited me in. Actually, a friend of mine invited me because he plays. He's a local guy here. He plays a harp guitar. And he's got another harp guitar player. So it's two harp guitars and a stick. Wow. More strings than you can ever imagine. It's like a string section at the Philharmonic. It'll be 13, 26, 38 strings for three guys. (laughs) Should be sponsored by Daddario or something. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I guess if, if they, I don't know if they make the harp strings, but, uh, Diodaria does make the six strings. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I have a couple of nice gigs coming up. If the restaurants, you know, start having, I mean, that, that's, that was my staple. The restaurants I haven't like toured a friend of mine, Tom grease graver. He got really lucky. We did a gig together about two months ago in Palm Springs. Wow. It was a wow. duo stick gig doing a simple little house party for 50 people. And he goes about his business and three or four weeks ago, he calls me, he goes, guess what? The California Guitar Trio is opening for King Crimson. One of the guitar players can't make it. I'm playing in the band. Wow. He went from like playing in front of 50 people to opening for King Crimson. And you know, now he's playing in front of 2,000 people. And he had to go out and buy a new shirt because uh, it was part of the contract. <laughs> but anyway, as you know, things happen. You know, just somebody calls you up or, or – an yeah. opportunity opens up and so are you um, still um for everyone watching this show you know like steve was was instrumental in me getting really into um this this journey and you know i i owe a lot to you know i've only been going a year and a half now but i'm really starting to progress on the the instrument now and it's sort of uh so i just you know do you still teach steve every day right. skype all over the world hong kong australia brooklyn new york um it's it's been great i i i enjoy teaching a lot i've been teaching starting with the guitar 50 years ago right so yeah, a I little shameless a plug here for anyone who uh who wants to get onto this journey you know you've got the world's best talent right at your fingertips over skype so um i can't recommend I you highly it. enough so you know and if they can spell your name i give them a 10 percent discount <laughs> oh, mate, the, the, the amount of names i got called in especially los angeles i got sinbad i got uh kimber the white lion i had handlebar o finland I had just, <laughs> i'm sure yeah it's not not the most common name but you informed me that finbar is actually barry right finbar's barry yeah well in ireland yeah so yeah barry is the anglicized version of finbar so you know you could call me Bazza, but you know, I don't, don't know if Bazza suits me too much. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm 
I like being Finbar. It's it's, it's weird enough to uh, to suit my brand of being w- weird. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody's ever called you Barack. No, no, no one's ever called me. Barack is Barry too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Barry Obama, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right, no apologies. Well, Steve, thanks so much, mate. It's it's been um, really great having you on. Thanks so much for the chat, and, and um, you know, um, I'll put some links to um, to some of the things. I've got some photos and some other bits and pieces I'll put up. But uh, yeah, if anyone's looking to to connect with Steve over lessons, let me know, or I'll um, I'll put a, a a link or something there somehow so they can get in contact with you. And uh, mate, just um. Keep the keep the journey alive. Keep inspiring others, and uh, your credit to the instrument and the industry. I appreciate that. And besides the lessons, if Robert Fripp is listening or any of those big shots, I'm available. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> Thank you for your time, and I appreciate your efforts. Thank you, buddy. Take care, mate.